What's good, fam? Teacher Eddie back with a reaction to Simple History, a day in the life of Stalin. Let's get into it. A day in the life of Stalin. Joseph Stalin, originally Ios Besariones de Zejuyagashvili, was born. That's a mouthful. Yeah, Joseph Stalin was not his uh, birth name. His birth name was... Joseph Stalin, originally, Ios Besariones de Zejuya Geshvili, was... Yeah, that doesn't, like, roll off the tongue as well as Joseph Stalin. Uh, Yosef. Yosef Stalin. Um, but yeah, he was born in Georgia. Not, not Georgia, in the United States, of course. Uh, and uh, as a young man, uh, he was, you know, he had a rough upbringing... Uh, a very abusive father. He also had a few uh, deformities. Uh, one of his uh, uh, legs was shorter than the other. He had webbed feet. Uh, or was it one of his arms? I don't know. It was one of them. Legs, arms, who cares? Um, and he was not viewed as uh, someone who was super intelligent, even though he was, just because of the way he carried himself and spoke. Uh, but he's, he proved everybody wrong. He was born in the small Georgian town of Gori in December of 1878. He grew up poor but excelled at school. After a brief stint in a seminary, Joseph became interested in socialist politics, inspired by the writings of Karl Marx. By 1912, Vladimir Lenin, who we had first met in 1905 at a Bolshevik conference in Temaphors, Finland, had made him a member of the Bolshevik Central Committee this paved the way for him to play a key role in the Bolshevik uprising of 1917, which brought about the demise of the Tsarist Russia and ultimately led to the establishment of the USSR in 1922. After the death of Lenin in 19... Yeah, so um, I go much more in depth into the Russian Revolution uh, in uh, the oversimplified reaction that I did, which I'll put a link up for it. But at the end of the day, Lenin regretted tremendously letting Stalin into the party. And uh, popular belief as well, he was his right hand. No, he wasn't his right hand man, uh, like in the ERB. Uh, Lenin despised Stalin. He didn't want him uh, to be in, but Stalin, to his credit, uh, whatever opinions you, we have of him, uh, the man knew what, how to get what he wanted. Uh, he knew how to schmooze the right people. He knew how to bribe the right people. He knew how to threaten the right people. And uh, Lenin, of course, wanted uh, Trotsky. But Stalin was uh, Stalin had the bigger balls. 1924 and the ensuing power struggle. It was Stalin who emerged victorious, ruling the USSR with an iron fist until his death in 1953. It's believed that Stalin was responsible for the deaths of at least 6 million people, while some scholars have argued that the figure was closer to 20 million. Stalin is, therefore, considered to have been one of the most ruthless and notorious dictators of the 20th century. Yeah, um, it's a mixed bag when it comes to Stalin, especially for Russians. So the number, yeah, the number varies anywhere from five to 20. Some people say 40 million. That includes um, not just, of course, executions, but starvation um, during uh, World War II, of course, uh, all the deaths. But a lot of Russians still defend Stalin to this day. And it's somewhat understandable because before Stalin, Russia was still a complete giant mess. Lenin really didn't have time because from the 1917 revolution, they really didn't establish, uh, you know, the communist order until 1922, like you said in the video. And by 1924, he's dead. And those last few years of his life, after a bunch of strokes, he was basically worthless. So Stalin, number one, not only brings order and becomes the leader that Russia needed at the time, he brings Russia into the light, uh, industrially, uh, on the world stage in, in so many different ways. He brings Russia out of the dark ages into the light, but also ultimately makes Russia a superpower 
And a lot of people still defend Stalin to this day in Russia as being a great leader. And of course, everything is propaganda and it's American lies and all that stuff. So whenever I do a video that touches on Stalin, it always riles my, my Ruski, uh, you know, patronage here. Uh, and they go ape shit and they call me names like Mudak, Peter, and all that good stuff. Despite the brutality of his regime and the violence often shown towards those who lived under its authority, Stalin was a crucial ally in the fight against Nazi Germany. Without the Soviet sure. Union's role in World War II, it's very likely that the Allies would have failed in their attempt to liberate Europe from the 100%. Axis powers. At the outbreak of the so-called Great Patriotic War, Stalin increased his workday significantly. Yeah, I love when students ask me, wait, why do they call it the Great War or the Great Patriotic War? Or why don't they call it World War II? And I was like, look, man, it wasn't like they were sitting there going, hey, this is World War II. Um, but yeah, Stalin did increase his workday tremendously uh, during, the, uh, during the war. Uh, but another reason for that was Stalin at this point in his life just didn't have what he, because previously he was married. His first wife died shortly before the revolution. Then he remarried and he and his wife, by all accounts, were very happy until she got kind of pissed and annoyed at a lot of his policies, especially towards the working class, the working poor, the peasants, uh, the famine, everything. She was completely not in his corner on that. And in 1932, she committed suicide by shooting herself in the heart. The official uh, Russian, uh, you know, uh, vantage point on her death was that she died of appendicitis because they didn't want to getting out in the news that Stalin's wife shot herself in the heart with a pistol. So for years and years and years, his kids didn't even know. They didn't find out until after the war. And it really didn't come to light until a, a long time after it happened. Prior to that, Stalin would work a lot, but he would work a lot from home. He would get up early in the morning. But after her, her suicide, um, he started getting up late in the afternoon. But he would put on like crazy hours until way after midnight. But the other thing is, uh, because of his relationship with his kids, which wasn't good, his wife is gone. He started basically forcing people to hang out with him kind of. And if you refused one of his movie nights or his dinners or, uh, listening to classical music with him, uh, he would threaten you and he would threaten you with either losing, um, you know, your position, but also with death, right? So he gets very lonely at this point as well. And he becomes um, in, an insomniac and he starts drinking a lot more wine, specifically Georgian wines, of course, which he called sleeping pills or sleeping aids. According to Field Marshal Georgi Zukov, Stalin worked as many as 15 hours a day and took no less than five leading positions upon himself. Yeah. These responsible roles included Supreme Commander, General Secretary of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party, Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars of the Soviet Union, Head of the State Defense Committee, and People's Commissar of Defense. Aware of the mounting stress on the Supreme Commander, Zukov was cleverly able to gauge Stalin's mood. When drawing deeply on his pipe, it meant he was in a good mood. If, however, Stalin failed to light his pipe once it was out of tobacco, it was a sign of impending anger. This understanding allowed Zukov to deal with Stalin in a way that the other generals couldn't. It's believed that Stalin suffered from insomnia and was not yes. an early riser. He often 100%. slept in his clothes, on a military-style camp bed in his personal residence, the Kunstvodacha. Failing any earlier emergencies that required his immediate attention, he usually rose at about 11 a.m. to receive the first reports on how the war was progressing. Stalin would have a light breakfast before spending several hours working, which involved taking reports, issuing orders, and conducting meetings either at his home in Kunstvo or at the Kremlin. 
Twice a day at noon and 9 p.m., he received updates from his Stavka plenipotentiaries, men who were directly overseeing the war effort. Failure to submit these reports was met by a harsh rebuke from the supreme leader, often in the form of threats against their position within the government and even against their lives. Yeah. In the early hours of the evening, Stalin would head to his office, known to the regime insiders as the Little Corner, which was on the second floor of the Kremlin. From here, he would run sessions of the GKO, the Soviet State Defense Committee, which can be best compared to a war cabinet. These sessions would go on for many hours, sometimes not ending until well into the night. This was a particularly tense time of day for Stalin's underlings, both military and civilian. The dictator's paranoia became increasingly worse throughout his reign, and entry to the little corner was tightly controlled. No weapons were permitted and everyone, no matter their rank, had to carry their identification papers. Visitors were encouraged to never disagree with Stalin, not to engage in small talk and to leave his presence. Well, to be fair, that's kind of a good rule. Don't disagree with me. Uh, no small talk. I don't give a shit. Um, I could actually kind of get behind that. But yeah, uh, so Marshal uh, Zhukov was probably one of the, if not the closest confidants to Stalin. And it was kind of like a marriage because, you know, like, like, like they said, you know, he was like, yeah, I could tell man, if he's drawing on a tobacco pipe, uh, everything's okay. If he doesn't like that shit, man, it's lights out for everybody. Like he was almost like his wife. He had to be, like give everybody all the little nuances and everything else. But, you know, Stalin waking up at 11 a.m., sometimes people are like, well, man, what the hell is that? What kind of... But 11 a.m., this motherfucker wouldn't go to bed until 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. And he would work straight through, 15 hours a day. And he would put in a lot of work. Again, not defending him, of course, in any way for his atrocities. But the man put in all of the work quickly once they had finished giving their report, the threat of arrest was ever-present. At the end of Stalin's heavy work day, he would frequently invite other high-ranking members of the regime to join him for dinner at Kuntzvo, often to be followed by a movie. These were not the kind oh, yeah, of invitations that could be turned down. After his men were finally allowed to return to their homes for a few hours of much-needed rest, Stalin would end the day reading books before finally going to sleep in the early hours of the morning. Whilst Stalin had the luxury of not having to rise until late into the day, many members of the regime were not so fortunate and had to be ready for work in the early hours in order to ensure that the state ran smoothly. Stalin's control over the lives of those who worked for him, including his generals, was so pervasive that many of them were even given set sleep times. Alexander Vasilevsky, chief of the general staff of the Soviet Armed Forces and deputy minister of defense, for example, was told that he had to be asleep between the hours of 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. Stalin would personally phone him during these times to ensure that his orders were being followed. Son of a bitch, man. I actually had a boss like that. God damn, he would constantly call to check in. Like if, if you know, if I was doing certain things at certain hours of the day, and one time he would call and hang up, call and hang up, call and hang up. Probably 20 times he called and hanged up. And then like on the 21st time I pick up the phone and again, there's silence. And I'm like, who the fuck is this? And then all of a sudden my boss after like, <gasps> he goes, is that the way you answer the phone? How dare you? I was like, bro, you just called 20. How do you know it was me? Cause we have caller ID. Right? This is not 1950, right? We have caller ID. I could see it's you calling over and over and over again. I was just checking in, making sure you were answering the phones. Such was the extent of Vasilevsky's workload, though, that he was forced to order his staff to lie to Stalin and say that he was resting when he was, in fact, trying to sneak in a few extra hours of work. In the early years of the war, while there was still a serious threat of defeat by the Germans, Stalin was not a heavy drinker. He also strongly encouraged sobriety in those who worked for him. From 1943 onward, though, this began to change, and Stalin's near-nightly dinners became increasingly drunken events, especially for his men. 
These affairs usually began late in the afternoon, when Stalin's magnates would receive invitations to join him for dinner. As before, these were not the sort of invitations that could be declined. Over the course of the next six hours or so, Stalin's associates were encouraged to drink to excess. Stalin joined in the drinking, although his drinks were often watered down on medical advice. These were not fun social events for the Soviet officials. A single mistaken word could place either themselves or their families in danger. In fact, the statesman Anastas Mikoyan claimed that Stalin forced us to drink to loosen our tongues. The situation became so dire that some of the men were prepared to risk Stalin's anger and attempt to maintain some degree of sobriety through tactics such as sneaking out of the room for naps or having waitresses pour them colored water instead of wine. It was in this atmosphere that a great deal of Soviet state business was done. Throughout the evening, Stalin would continue to issue that explains orders, a lot. receive messages, and even approve executions if necessary. According to Field Marshal Zhukov, many decisions relating to the armed forces and the security of the Soviet Union were regulated in these unofficial meetings, as the contingent of the gatherings largely consisted of the USSR's highest ranking officials. Late into the night, usually around 2 a.m., Stalin would suggest watching a movie, sometimes more than one. He is known to have favored westerns, detective films, and gangster movies. After this, he would sometimes suggest another bite to eat, meaning that his poor, exhausted, and now hungover officials often didn't get home until well past. Oh, these poor bastards. They were like, man, can you get a hobby? Can we get somebody to come in here and blow them? I mean, something, man. We got shit, we got shit to do, Yosef. Come on, man. How many times are you going to make us watch John Wayne? We've seen, we know all the, we know the Duke. We get the Duke. We've seen the Duke. The Duke, the Duke, the Duke. As daybreak. As in earlier years, Stalin would end his day reading books before finally falling asleep. This state of affairs continued until March 1st, 1953, when Stalin suffered a massive stroke. Man, they, they had to... Man, they had to include the fact that he peed himself in there. God damn. He lingered on for several days before ultimately passing away on the evening of the 5th. Following the appropriate preparation, his body was then displayed in the famous Hall of Columns for mourners throughout the Soviet Union to visit. Yeah, originally his body, um, much like Joseph, um, uh, I'm sorry, Vladimir Lenin's body uh, was placed in a mausoleum for display. Uh, but after, um, after a few years after his death, it was removed, even though Lenin's body is still there. Like, geez, like fudge, man. It's coming up on a hundred years since he died. And that body is still in that mausoleum. Like, you know what? Sometimes you need to let go. You need to let go, Russia. Like, like, like Jack and Titanic. Just let go. Let go. But either case, I, there's a great video about it, you know, a day in the life of Joseph Stalin, uh, pretty much everything on point here. Like I said earlier, a lot of the stuff that I mentioned, they eventually covered, uh, the drinking, you know, they say it started in 43. Uh, I could be wrong. I just remember that it started much earlier than that. Uh, but either case, that's just a small nitpick, but you could see what type of, I mean, the man was obviously a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, but again, his paranoia got deeper and deeper as the war went on and on. But again, those, those, those poor people who had to, uh, tiptoe around him and he'd be like, come on, let's go watch movie. But, um, sir, it's, it's two o'clock in the morning, but it's the Duke. We watch men who shot Liberty well. It's, oh boy. Either case, let me know in the comment section, what you think. Let me know any other videos you'd like me to react to. I've been Teacher Ready, and we're going to shout out the Patreons now, and I'll catch you next time. Fam! And as always, shouting out Teacher Ready's Patreons who keep things running here. Starting with the top Chancellor's tier, Elena G, Alex, Cuckles, Kiara, John Alonzo, Naval Colt, and the Hollow King. The Principal's tier, Addison Lynn, Blue Tech, Chad A, Chris H, Chrissy, Clement, Freeman, Laura, Lord Gandalf, Muri Kakari, Nathan M, Quiet J, Rachel H, Rob N, Robin B, and Vijandra. I've been Teacher Eddie, and I'll catch you next time. 